moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. So this morning, let's talk about names for a while. Uh, you know my name, Joey, but that name is very insignificant. It has no power. It has no beauty whatsoever within itself. It commands nothing, changes nothing, stands for nothing. In fact, more than likely, the only reason you would ever say my name is because I am not paying attention to you. And therefore, you would say my name. And that happens often. My wife is smiling. I hate to be the one to tell you, but names in our culture are pretty much meaningless except for the fact that they distinguish one from another. That's about it, like red and blue. That's how meaningless our names are in our culture. It just helps us distinguish Chris and Johnny is basically it as far as our names. Now, titles that we have do have somewhat of meaning. At home, I am known as Dad, which at most times does elicit respect and love and obedience from my kids. So titles can mean a little more than our names, but our names pretty much don't. Our Creator has a name, but this is interesting. You may not know this. We do not know exactly how to pronounce the name of our Creator. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, this is what you'll find. Four letters. Nothing there to work with to pronounce, really. Even a Hebrew person would tell you that. Or a Jewish person. We pronounce it Yahweh, but we have no idea whether or not that's accurate at all. An Orthodox Jew puts the dash in there because they feel like it's very disrespectful to even spell his name. That's how highly they think of the name of Yahweh. So they'll put a dash in there. Even in their orthodoxy, they will spell God. Did that ever come up? They'll spell God like... I may have to... Uh, did it come up there? It's not going to come up. Or it's taking its time. They'll spell it rather than G-O-D, they'll put G-D. D because they do not want to offend the name of God by even writing it on a piece of paper. They hold His name so highly. Now, God has given us many more of His titles. We don't just have His name. And I could be endless here, but just to name a few, we have the Lord God, the God of heaven and of earth, the creator and the sustainer of, all, of, of life and on and on we could go. However, all of the names of God represent Him and His work and what He has done, who He is. Everything with God means something. Even Moses gives us the name Jehovah Jireh as he was about to slay Isaac. The Lord will provide. And so His names always mean something. Now, we do know how to pronounce the name of his son, right? He was given a very common Jewish name while on earth. Uh, let me give you some of those. This is what they call him if you were a Jew in the Hebrew. Yeshua or Yeshu. That's who they would call Jesus. If you were a Greek person, and for some reason it's not going to come up either. I must have entered it in a wrong, Tyler. If you're a Greek person, you would pronounce it Iesus. Iesus. Now, if you were Spanish, what would you say? Jesus. But in English, we call him Jesus. Now, that name obviously has profound meaning. And as I said, it was a very common name, but it was given to a very uncommon child. 
I want to talk more about his name in just a little while, but I want to take you back into Old Testament and Jewish culture so you can kind of help develop this thought of names because names in Old Testament and Jewish culture always meant something. Uh, in Genesis 3.20, that's not it. We'll be there in a minute. It says in Genesis 3.20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Now, I thought about that for a while and I'm like, so what did you call her before she was the mother of all the living? He may have done what I did with Paige. I just looked at her with a silly grin on my face the whole time before I ever called her by name. And I'm sure Adam did the same thing. I just can't believe she's mine. And so he names her Eve to denote that she is the mother of all children, okay, or of mankind. There's thousands of names, but I'll only give you one more with meaning. The father of music or the father of instruments in the Bible was given the name Yubal. And it means it was named Yubal because he was the father of all those who play the lyre or the pipe. In other words, windward instruments. That's what that meant, Yubal. Now, this is what fascinating. I'm no linguist. Abby, you can study this later. But they had the, the year, they celebrated the year of the Jubilee in Jewish history or Jewish culture. And the Jubilee in Hebrew is spelled very similar to Yubal. It's almost the exact word, okay? It's just slightly different. So I'm thinking it's pronounced very similar. But here's what's interesting. Do you know what they do during the, during the time of the Jubilee? They blew the trumpet. The whole time. So names had profound meaning in the Old Testament and Jewish culture. Uh, and it's not just people. There were places. In Genesis 11, the Lord is angry with the people because of what they are doing. And it says in Genesis 11, 9, Therefore, its name, meaning the city, was called Babel because it was there that the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. In other words, they were building a city. God came down and divided all their languages, and that's why we have so many languages. And so therefore they called the city Babel. Reason that they were doing that, because man was doing something specific in his life. He was trying to build a name for himself. Genesis 11, it says this, The people said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and let us make ourselves a name. That's what they were trying to do. Man's always trying to make his name mean something. But man can't do that. Only God can do that. And that's why in Genesis chapter 12, the very next chapter, God says this to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. So in Genesis 11, we're trying to make our own name great because we're going to build a tower up to heaven. God comes down and confuses all their languages so they can't do that. They call that place Babel. Then he turns around to Abraham. He says, I'm going to make your name great. And our children still sing a song about Father Abraham because he is the father of our faith. God made his name great. So that's about names, but Abraham has taught us what we need to do with the name of God. Now this is the part I don't want to lose you, so if you're getting sleepy, slap yourself just a little bit. Abraham teaches us what we need to do with the name of God. You've heard this from Romans 10 all your life. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We've all heard that. We, we, if you've ever shared the gospel, you've used that. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a problem with that. Here's what's wrong with that. We don't know what it means to call without understanding the Old Testament, and we don't understand the significance of the name of God without the Old Testament. We understand what it means to be saved. In fact, it's a passive voice in the text, which means it's something God does. He saves us. But in order to be saved, you have to call and you're not going to call on him like you'd call on Joey because you're not paying attention, Joey. 
And you don't treat his name like you would my name. That means something very different. So I want us to explore that this morning as Abraham teaches us. Now, Genesis 12, 8. Maybe this thing will work from here. Look at what Abraham does. Abraham proceeded from where he was to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar. Now, what's he about to do? Why would you build an altar? Have sacrifices and worship. Right? Look what it says. He built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, I could have repeated that because it does again in Genesis 13. It says the very same thing. Abraham had his altar and he came to the altar. He kneeled at the altar and he called upon the name of the Lord in worship. Now, I find it fascinating because Abraham was a good dad and we need to be a good dad. And Abraham taught his son Isaac how to worship. So when you get to Genesis chapter 26, this is what it says of Isaac. So Isaac built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. And so we're beginning here in the Old Testament context to understand what it means to call. Much of what that means is to worship God. And it moved from Abraham into his son, into his son, into an entire nation of people. All the way down to their leader, Moses. And this is what it says of Moses when he's on top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. The Lord descended in the cloud. The Lord stood there with Moses as Moses called upon the name of the Lord. He's not calling, Lord, Lord, where are you? Lord, come and save me. God's standing next to him. Don't miss the picture. And I've got some idea, the text doesn't say, that Moses is on his face calling upon the name of the Lord in worship. Moses is worshiping God and God is standing there and the text says Moses was calling upon the name of the Lord. This is all throughout the Old Testament. The Lord is great and He's greatly to be praised. And so we call upon the name of the Lord in worship. I had you turn to Psalms 103. Let me get there. And I want to look at a few passages of that. Very quickly. This is David, and I could have given you a ton of these, but I'm just going to give you a few of these. Look at Psalms 103. Now, if you remember when we started Acts, we first started in Luke, and before we started Luke, we started in Psalms 103, and we would stand and recite this together. Look at what he says Bless the Lord, Psalms 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his what? Holy name. There it is. And I told you, with all that was in me, gave us a picture of upon bended knee. And so I said, we could literally read this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, upon bended knee. Bless his holy name. So David is calling on the name of the Lord in worship and he's blessing what? The name. The name of God. Now watch how he does that. Look in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things. He's just going on and on and on about what all great things God has done. And he's saying, Lord, I just bless your name. You've done all these wonderful things. Look down at verse 8. Lord, you're compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far you have removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He's calling on the name of the Lord in worship and he's praising his name. Look at verse 19. 
The Lord has established His throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, all you His angels. Look at verse 21. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts. Look at verse 22. Bless the Lord, all you His works. In all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord. And then He comes back, Oh my soul. David's calling on the heavens and the earth in all of creation to sing praises to God and bless His holy name. Now, you can go to Acts 3. I'll be there in a little while. But I want to read to you just a few more Psalms. Psalms 29. Don't turn there. Don't keep up with me. You You go to Acts 3. Psalms 29. Listen to this. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Psalms 30. Sing praise to the Lord, you His godly ones. Give thanks to His holy name. For our heart rejoices in God because we trust in His holy name. Psalms 34, 3. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Psalms 54, willingly I sacrifice to you. I give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. See, he doesn't have a name like we have a name. He's got a very special name. And his name should always elicit praise from his people. Now, it was sin which caused God to reject His people, Israel. And I find it fascinating, and we've been here before, but it was their sin that God called a defaming of what? His name. Listen to this as I read to you Ezekiel 36. When they came to the nations where they went, meaning to the promised land, they profaned my holy name Because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they come out of the land that he gave them. Verse 21, but I had concern for my holy name, God said, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, Ezekiel, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you profaned in their midst. Then all the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. So let me, put the, let me connect some dots for you because I don't want to lose you. We have the name. And His name should always cause His people to call upon His name in worship. God says when you choose sin... You defame, dishonor, discredit my name. That is the opposite of worship. Rather than making much of the name of God, you discredit the name of God. When we come into the New Testament, we finally meet the one that God has promised He would send, who would walk in perfect obedience and always live and do and speak in a way that would honor the name of the Father. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the Son. Not only did He come from Him, but He shared the name with Him. And the early church understood this quite well. This is what the early church would stand and recite. Being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, for what reason? His obedience and His death. His obedience to the name and to the will of His Father. And that will led Him to the cross to die. Because of this, you see, look what God has done. God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Where did Jesus get such a name? It was given to Him by the Father because He lived in such a way as to glorify the name of the Father always. Just listen at the sound of His name. One day we will all fall and praise. Just when it's said. We will love Him so much in that day. When we hear His name in heaven, we will fall and praise for such a great name. The very purpose of the existence of our church is tied to His name. Remember what our Lord said, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And obviously you have to teach them to obey or observe all that I've commanded in order that we might honor the name. We can't honor the name unless we walk in obedience to the name. Therefore we go and make disciples and we baptize them in the name and then we teach them to live in a way that will honor the name. So, if you're in Acts, just a little bit of your introduction, look at Acts chapter 2. Peter's very first sermon will end with a call to the name of Christ. Look at Acts 2 verse 38. Peter concludes his message with this. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You see that? Now listen, we can't, we can't mess this up because we've got a lot of people running around doing everything, calling on the name of Jesus, treating it like it's a magic potion or something bizarre. It's not special in that way. You don't tag in Jesus' name on the end of everything thinking your will, gonna, your will is going to get done. It's not magical or mystical. It's of God. And if you remember, Peter tries to remove this because look back up in chapter 2, verse 21. He quotes, which we see in Romans 10, 13, but he's quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. Look at Acts 2, 21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There it is again. Now, hopefully at this time, you understand more what it means to call in the name of the Lord. It's not like calling my name. It's not like God's up there, you know, not paying attention, waiting on somebody to holler His name. To call on His name means to bow your heart and your will to a name that is so great that the only thing you can do Justly is to worship God for His great name. He doesn't have a name like our names. His name means everything. And to call upon it is to realize it and to worship Him. So that sets us up for Acts chapter 3. I'm convinced, and I tried to show you this last week, that 316 is a very central passage in all of chapter 3. I wrote it down literally for you last week, or I typed it literally, so it would be easier for me, and so it would be easier for you to see. So look with me at the board, and this is what it literally is translated from the Greek. So you can see the emphasis he wants to put on the name. Peter says, after healing and sharing the gospel in the temple, he says, on the basis of the faith in the name of His, it is the name of His which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given this guy perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter heals a lame man. Everybody comes running to him. 
how did you do that? It wasn't me. Then how did you do that? It wasn't me. Let me tell you what it was. It was the power of His name. And English is not like Greek. They do things like this to place emphasis. Faith has emphasis here. The only way that you can respond to the name of Christ is have faith. Trust in Christ. That is it. That's all you can do is trust in Christ. And when we trust in His name, it's everything He is and everything He's done, just like in the Old Testament, when they would call on the name of God. It's His whole being. And so when we see this, He wants to put emphasis on faith, but He's really trying to put emphasis on the name of His. And they didn't write His name because they want to put emphasis on the name. So He says the name of His, the name of His. So you'll get it. It's Jesus Christ. It's the name that God has given him. So now, Acts 3, 6. Look what Peter does. And by the way, there's names of Jesus all the way through chapter 3. I'm going to talk about 3 and we're going to be finished this morning. Peter walks up to the lame man. I'll tell you what, let's start in verse 1 to catch context. Acts 3, look at verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb were being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms from those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed their gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to look at them in his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And the man leapt up and ran into the temple and was praising God. Now let's look at these three titles. The first name that we see in the text is the name Jesus. Now that's the sweetest name you'll ever hear on this side of heaven and on the other side of heaven. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. It's the sweetest name on earth. You'll never hear a sweeter name than Jesus. It's the name that children sing about because it is the name that reminds us of how much God loves us in sending His Son to die for us. There's no sweeter name than Jesus. And let me talk to you about this for just a few moments. If your heart this morning is spiritually where this man was physically, then all you need to hear is Jesus and it is well with your soul. Let me explain. Look back at, at chapter 3, verse 2. Acts 3, verse 2. A man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along. Stop right there. Chapter 4, we learn when Peter's getting trouble for healing this man that this man is over 40 years old. He's never known anything else and he's a 40-something year old man. Everywhere he's ever been, somebody has physically had to pick him up and carry him where he wanted to go. If he wanted to go to bed, he had to call for help so somebody could pick him up and carry him to bed. If he wanted to go to the table and eat, somebody had to come along and pick up this 40-year-old man and carry him to the table to eat. If he wanted to go to the bathroom, he had to call for help because somebody had to pick him up and carry him to the bathroom. If he wanted to go to the temple, if he wanted to go to the store, he had to be carried. He could do nothing for himself. Look what else. Verse 2. They used to set him down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Everywhere he wanted to be, somebody had to set him exactly there. 
And if you came back an hour later, you're going to find him because he's going to be exactly where you set him when you left. I.e., he can't move. If I want to go from one pew to the next, somebody's going to have to carry me and set me down because I can't do that myself. And the reason they did that, look back to the text, verse 3, in order to beg. That's all he could do. I cannot, can you imagine, men, being 40-something years old and you cannot lift a finger for yourselves. You can't work. You can't go. You can't do. You can't help. You can't do anything. The only thing you can do is lift your hand and hopefully somebody beyond you would extend a hand to help you. That is all that he could do. Nothing about me can benefit me. If anything's going to help me, you're going to have to give it to me. Because I can't help myself. Now, if you're there spiritually, if you get that, and you understand that sin has left you lame, and sin has left you blind, and sin has corrupted your heart and your mind, and you cannot do anything for yourself, if you understand that because of sin, if you were ever moved from out of sin anywhere else and set you down anywhere else but sin, it would be by the grace of God. The only thing that you could ever do is beg that Jesus, as He passed by, might somehow extend a hand and get you out of death and condemnation? If you get that, like this man understood his physical problem, all you need to hear is Jesus. That's it. Because you understand, God, you'll have to pick me up and carry me. Because I cannot go where I long to go. And if in repentance and sincerity of heart you turn from your sin and call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. That's not the only name that we get. If you're stubborn of heart, there's one more name. And most of us are a little more stubborn of heart. We get the name Christ. Christos, meaning Savior, meaning Messiah, meaning the anointed of God. Christ reminds us that God has only chosen one name to be the Savior of all mankind. God has chosen and anointed only one name by which men can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. Therefore, I command you this morning to repent and call on the name in in adoration and worship and praise because He is the only name that can save you. Look what Peter says in Acts 3, 19 and 20. He says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus. Look at the article, the Christ, which is appointed for you. That's the whole point. God has anointed and appointed only one name. So if Jesus doesn't do it for you and you're a little more stubborn of heart, You have to realize, God goes on, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one of God. Therefore, your only response to Him is to call on His name in worship and in praise. That's it. That's all you've got. There is no other name, right? There is no other name. There is no other Savior There is no other Messiah. 
You cannot work or do anything to please God. Remember the beggar? God's not going to run some kind of comparison and put up Rob and Joey. I don't want him to. I'll lose in every case. You're not going to do anything to please God. He is the Christ, the only Christ. You better repent and believe and worship your king. Interesting, he goes further. There's one more name in the text. It is the name Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Look back at your Bibles. And I'll see if I can find it here. There you go. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene walk. Now this one's a bit of a stumbling block. I think it seems like in the text God is moving from the soft heart and the tender heart all the way to the stubborn heart. And I'll tell you what this meant. This would not have impressed a Jew at all being from Nazareth. If you'll remember, when God was calling his disciples, he called Philip, right? Philip runs to get Nathaniel. And Philip says to Nathaniel, hey, we found the one whom Moses and the law and all the prophets spoke about. Oh yeah, who is it? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, can any, anything good come out of Nazareth? Typical Jewish response. What do you mean Jesus of Nazareth? You mean something good can actually come out of that town? Nazareth was not a respectable place. It was comprised of poor folks who were simple people who held simple jobs like a carpenter. This is not a fancy place. If his name had been Jesus of Jerusalem, now Jews could have bought into that. And here's why. They always knew the Messiah would come from David. So if the Messiah is going to come from the line of David, wouldn't it just make sense for the Messiah to be born in the city of David, which was Jerusalem? So if he'd have been Jesus of Jerusalem, the Jews would have been like, yeah, I totally get that. He's from Jerusalem. But God put a stumbling block in their way because of their stubborn hearts. If his name had been Jesus of heaven, that's straight up truth. We'd have all believed in that, right? I can buy into that because that's the truth. He's from heaven. But it was Jesus of Nazareth for this reason. He's just a man. He's fully God, but he's just a common man. Man, look what Isaiah said about him in Isaiah 53. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Meaning, if Jesus came in our lifetime, we'd go, <laughs> son of God, okay, tell me another one. That's just some dude, man. He looks like everybody else. That's why it was Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. So do not be stubborn of heart. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That common man is now seated at the right hand of God on a throne, and he is king. Now, this would be a great time for an invitation, right? Not a chance. I will not invite you to such a great name. Peter did not invite a lame man to walk. If you'll look back at Acts 3, 6, you'll see that Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. He didn't say in the name of Jesus Christ, would you like to get up and walk? In the name of Jesus Christ, do you want to try to stand up? Let me help you. It was a command. In the power of the name of Jesus, 
walk. And by faith, the man reaches out his hand and takes hold of the hand of Peter and he stands. So I'm not going to give you an invitation. Rather, I'm going to give you a command because his name is so great. And besides that, God does that in 1 John. Look at what he says. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a commandment to believe. It's not an invitation. If you do not want to believe and call out to his name in worship for the rest of your life, your disobedience and your condemnation is just because you have disobeyed and dishonored the great name of of God. Therefore, there is no invitation. There's a command. Repent, turn from your sin, and put your faith in Christ. To do anything else is to disobey God and to defame His name. I began by telling you that our names are meaningless. But I want to leave you with this thought. One day, your name will be extraordinarily meaningful. In fact, one day, your name is going to be eternally meaningful. John, in his vision, in Revelation 21, gives us a vision of actually being there in the city of God when it's all said and done. Let me read you the words of this vision John had. He said, I saw no temple in it. For God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine, for the glory of the Lord illumined the city, and its lamp was the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will never be night, the gates always are open. They will never be closed. They will bring the glory of the honor of the nations into it. And listen... Nothing unclean, meaning sinful, and no one who practices abomination or lying or any kind of sin shall ever come into this city, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, right now your name doesn't really mean anything. But one, name, your, one day your name's going to mean everything. When the Lamb opens the book and He looks in His book to call out the names of those who called out to Him in worship. One day, your name will mean everything to you. And it has to be recorded in God's Lamb book of life. Let's pray.